Jesus. And all God's people together say, amen, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I praise God for his marvelous grace this morning. Are you grateful for his grace? Yeah, amen. Every one of us has fallen short of God's glory, but he loves us and wants to forgive us all and be with us, and I praise him for that. Over the last couple weeks, we've been talking about growth and having people along the journey with us in, in this journey of grace. And as a vision for this church, we use four words that are defining what that vision that God has for the church from his word. Uh, they are gather, grow, serve, and go. Let's say those four together. Can you remember them? Gather, grow, serve, and go. Let's say that one more time. Gather, grow, serve, and go. If you notice the people who followed Jesus on his earthly ministry, it began with a gathering of people. And it was, crowds began to follow Jesus. And for many people, that's when the, their, their following of Jesus began. We we sometimes think about the 12, but there were many more who followed Jesus. And as they gathered around Jesus, some of them made commitments to pursue him and to grow. And through their journey of growth, they realized that God has commissioned them and gifted them to serve him. And they began to do it with Jesus. And eventually Jesus sends out and tells them to go. And this is the vision that he has for the church. If we read in the book of Acts, we see this is exactly what he did with the church. First they gathered, and then they began to spiritually grow, and then they served, and they went out and duplicated that in other places. That is the vision of God for his church. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about these words. We're going to be talking about them and looking in the Bible and see what it, the biblical examples of these four things as a church. During Jesus' earthly ministries, they progressed, gathering with Jesus, growing in their relationship with Jesus, serving with Jesus, and going in the name of Jesus. Now, not everyone progressed in their relationship with Jesus, but those who did followed this progression. As we think about these things over the next few weeks and today as we think about gathering, please consider th these couple things. Where are you in this journey and where are you lacking? Also think about how the church today in 2022 could best help people to progress in their relationship of, at, with Jesus through these stages. This is the vision that God has for us. Before people really got to know Jesus, they spent time with him and they gathered around him. And, and the scriptures actually say that crowds gathered around Jesus. Now, I'm not going to give you every scripture that talks about that because there are many but some examples here are in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. In Matthew 15, 30, it said, great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet and healed them. Think about the faith of that. People gathered around, all those that they knew who were sick, and said, come on, you're going with me. I'm taking you before Jesus, and we're laying you at his feet. Imagine, that takes faith, doesn't it? I'm wondering as a church, do we still do that? Do we still have the faith that those early disciples did to take people that we know that are sick and hurting and lay them down at Jesus' feet and saying, Jesus, we can't do anything about this, but you can. And we're laying them here at your feet and laying that 
on Jesus. But from Jesus' birth until his death, he was surrounded by a great company or crowds. Remember the crowd of angels that announced the, to the lowly shepherds the birth of the good shepherd? All the way through his life until the crowd yelled, crucify him, crucify him before his death. You might say, well, that's a different kind of crowd, but it is still part of the crowd. See, Jesus healed people. He taught people many things. He prayed with the people. Crowds gathered to him to hear him, to touch him, or to be touched by him. People traveled to seek Jesus out. And I know that we live in, in a society and in, in a country where faith in Jesus uh, is intermixed with all the other faiths that are out there being advertised that people can choose from. But I still believe that people are seeking not necessarily religion, but authentic relationship with Jesus. They might not know how to describe it. They might not know what it would look like, but they want to be connected with God. People sought after Jesus. In Mark 3, 7 through 10, it says this, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all what he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the region across the Jordan and around Tyre, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had already healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. There was such a great moving through Jesus that people were being healed, people were being delivered, that the crowds began, began to, to grow and grow and Jesus said, have a boat ready, I'm gonna have to back up, they're crowding me. And I don't wanna be crowded that way. I want you to just imagine that. And I don't know. I know today we can say, well, crowds won't flock after Jesus anymore. And, and people don't want Jesus. You know what? I believe, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I believe that people still want healing. I believe people still want to be delivered. Do you know anybody? who wants deliverance in their life? Do you know anybody who wants healing in their life? Anybody who wants to be set free? Anybody who's in bondage? I think if we really got to know them and really talk with them, people want it. They really want Jesus. And they really want to believe that they could be set free. These verses, people were coming to Jesus from around 12,000 square miles. You know those places he just mentioned? They came from east, west, north, south to see and be with Jesus of Nazareth. All kinds of people gathered to Jesus. Today, this morning, this is our gathering. And this gathering is about Jesus. Today, we're gathered in the name of Jesus. Amen? All right? We're not gathered in the name of Pastor Michael. We're not gathered in the name of Lombard. We're gathered in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's why we carry the name Nazarene. We are gathered here in the name of Jesus because we want to be with Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. We are seeking after Jesus. And I recognize today that there are all kinds of people in person and online in this gathering. And we're all at different points in our journey with Jesus. And we all have different questions. We're all at different places and different experiences. See, in the crowds that gathered around Jesus, there were skeptics. 
There were curious people, excited people, confused people, ignorant people, needy people, and more. You guys get the point, right? Guess what? In the gatherings around Jesus, there are going to be all kinds of people. Not everybody who gathers in the name of Jesus understands. And I think if we really take a survey, a lot of us will, will acknowledge there's a lot we don't understand. I think there might even be people who really are not really sure, can Jesus really do those miracles we read about or heard about? Can Jesus really deliver me? I'm not sure. I'm going to wait and see. I'm sure that there are people that are gathered here and with us that might just be curious, that don't necessarily have an intimate relationship with Jesus, but are here trying to figure things out and trying to understand it for themselves. I think there are people that are among us that are, might even be clueless about salvation and that what really God wants to do for our lives. I believe there's a mixture of people within the gathering today. And guess what? That's okay. And actually, that's what was modeled in the gatherings around Jesus. And that was what was happening in the early church. And people would come to the disciples and ask them, well, what about this and what about that? Do you think the disciples are like, you should already know that. I'm sorry, you don't belong with this gathering. No, they love that and wanted to answer their questions and bring them in. You see, the gathering of the church is about all kinds of people seeking Jesus in all kinds of ways. Yeah, amen. And it needs to be a place where all kinds of people can come to seek answers, to seek Jesus. You see, Everyone was welcome to gather with Jesus. He even taught his disciples to not turn away children, not turn away sinners. And they even ridiculed him. Do you know who these people are? And Jesus is like, yes, I do. There were skeptics in the crowd. Imagine being in a synagogue when Jesus declares that he's the Christ the Savior promised to the world. Imagine feeling the atmosphere, the love and the light in a room. What a declaration. But then the response for, from the people in the room, some were saying, no, 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 no. That can't be true. You know, they said, ho, ha, ha, ha. Hey, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this the mother's son? Uh, his mother, Mary, right? Aren't these his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas? Aren't those his brothers? Could you hear the skepticism there? Can you hear that there were people that didn't fully understand in that room? But, but there's always going to be people who are skeptical of Jesus, right? And it's not that they're going to go away anytime soon. We have skeptics throughout the country, around the world. There were skeptics in Jesus' crowd. Pharisees often questioned Jesus' authority. There were curious in a crowd. Once when Christ and his disciples left in a ship on the sea, Mark recounts that people saw them departing. And it says in Mark 6, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. I point this out there that they, people didn't really even know what was going on. All they knew was that they wanted to be around this man. All they knew was that there was something there. They were curious. And when Jesus went to the other side, they didn't plan. They didn't uh, go pack. It says they got up and followed in hopes of finding something that they were needed. Do you believe there are people out there that are still looking for the things that they need in their lives? Yeah, why are people going to Buddhism and why are they going to other religions and, and, and false things? Because they're trying to find answers for their lives. It's not that they're saying, oh, I want to go down a, ba a path that's going to destroy me. No, most people are saying, I'm trying to find answers. 
People want the truth in their lives. Many of them are searching, and they're curious. And these people here, they were curious, and they just had to go. And people want to go, and they want to hear, and they want to find out. They don't want to hear from people telling them your life is wrong and your life is bad and and you're all messed up. They already know that. (laughs) That's why they're looking. They're not coming to be a part of the crowd. They're a part of the crowd because they're trying to find answers through Jesus. You see the difference? They don't want to be a part of a crowd that says, okay, do you fit in with the rest of us? Do you look like the rest of us? Are you acting? Where are you in your journey? Do you believe what we believe? No, the crowd is there because of Jesus. And when you look at the crowd, it's a very diverse crowd. There were skeptics. There were curious people. And you know there were excited people in the crowd, people in the crowd that were healed by Jesus. You know, they were the real quiet ones that didn't say anything and just stood, sat in a corner. No, there were people who were seeing things with their eyes for the very first time in their lives. There were people who were lame and all of a sudden could walk. Some of them for the very first time because they were born that way. There were people whose lives were totally transformed and changed and they were excited. Imagine that day when Jesus rode in on a donkey going into the city and people just witnessed, and many of them, that Lazarus, who was dead, was risen from the, arose from the dead. He was delivered from the grave. Imagine their excitement. They couldn't keep quiet. And they were shouting. Many of you know the scene, right? On Palm Sunday, we celebrate it. And how the noise they were making. And the Pharisees said, shh, 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 hey, 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 tell them to keep quiet. You know, we have them in the crowd too, right? Aren't there some in our crowd that are excited about Jesus? And there are some that are saying, you guys are a little too loud. That's the crowd. That's the gathering. There are going to be some who sing out, shout out, even some who say, Pastor, tell those disciples to keep quiet. But nonetheless, there are always some who have been touched by God in such a way, healed by God in such a way, who have been miraculously delivered that just cannot keep quiet. In the silent crowd, I say that. Jesus healed a man with leprosy and asked him not to tell anyone. But in Mark 1, 45, it says, instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. He couldn't keep it in. And I'm praying that Jesus does things in our lives to where some of us just cannot keep it in. You know, there were some in the crowd that were just confused. Immediately following the second miracle of of Jesus feeding the multitude of 5,000 men in time, in one time, John gives this interaction between Christ and some of these people that were part of that crowd and didn't understand what Jesus was doing. You know, sometimes as followers and disciples of Jesus, we don't get it. We're so focused on the needs outside of what is most important. In John 6, 30 through 36, it says this. So they asked him, what sign then would you give that we might see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who had given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For a bread of God is a bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. Do you get this? Jesus did this miracle of feeding 5,000 people. A few verses later, he's having this interaction with some of those people. And they're asking, well, could you give me a sign? 
Could you just imagine that? Jesus just fed 5,000 people, and then they come up to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, could you give me a sign? Now, thank goodness I'm not Jesus, but could you, I'd be like, are you hungry? We have baskets full left. Did you not just experience the sign that I was giving to you? And, and you're looking for a sign, and they're saying, well, the, Mo, Moses provided us that manna, our ancestors, every day, every day. And Jesus is like, yeah, but my, the Father in heaven, not Moses, the Father in heaven is providing you a bread that if you eat of it, you will be satisfied now and forever. And they're like, oh, where is it? Is it that bread over there in that basket? Or that one? Which, which one? Give it to us. We'll eat that bread. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm the bread. I'm speaking symbolically here, people. You need to receive what I'm giving you. Receive me. And then he ends with this. Uh, you still don't believe. See, there will always be some in the crowd who don't get it, right? But it's okay. We want them in a crowd because one day they will get it. I believe that. If they follow Jesus long enough, if they seek long enough, their eyes will be opened and they will get it, right? Hallelujah. Now, there's skeptics, there's curious, there's excited, there are confused. But you know, there are people that are part of the gathering of Jesus that are unaware of Jesus' purpose within the gathering. I believe this is, and within the church of our gatherings, is the most dangerous of the crowd. See, the hard part about it is, is that it usually happens in moments of sincerity, but we just don't get it. We do our best to follow our Savior, but oftentimes we forget to look around and just see what's happening. Come on, I'm guilty of this. I'm a man too. I, you know, you come in, you do what you have to, you go find your seat, you put your stuff down, you go to the restroom, do this. Don't forget you have to see so-and-so and you have to see so-and-so before you leave and then you come in here and all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's starting. I hope they sing what I want them to sing. I hope he prays about so-and-so because they really need it. I hope I get entertained with the message or get something that I haven't heard before and then we need to go and make sure it's done at a certain time because I have somewhere I have to be. See, I'm the only one in a room that ever has experienced that. None of you have ever. <laughs> it was obvious in the silence. But sometimes God, no, 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 no. God always has a plan for the gathering. And it might not always be centered. Ooh, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. It's not always centered around what he wants to do for me. Sometimes the gathering is meant for an individual at that moment who needs healing. And the rest of us need to be there for that. And there was a man who one time left the service and told the pastor, Pastor, I didn't like the singing and I didn't like the message I didn't like anything today and the pastor had more guts than I because he said to him good because it wasn't about you this morning see I would never tell you that here's the thing sometimes it's about that woman sometimes it's about that man sometimes it's about these people but it's always about Jesus and it's always about what he wants. And you might say, well, why doesn't Jesus just do that one-on-one-on-one? -on -one -on -one? Because we need to be a part of that. We need to be witnesses to that. We need to experience that together. Because that's what Jesus wants. There's a remarkable story about a woman who has the issue of blood. Any of you remember that story? 
she, she has this issue and just doctors couldn't figure it out and all. I'm not going to talk about her. But in Mark 5, starting in verse 24, it says, So Jesus went with him, a large crowd followed and pressed all around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. You, you guys hear me? How many years? 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of doctors and has spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I would be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her own suffering. At once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you ask who touched me? We'll stop there. Think about this. There's a crowd of people. By the way, they had an agenda. They're on their way to Jarius' house, and they, their minds were on something else. Their minds were going to the place where they thought Jesus was going to work next. Have we ever been there? Okay, this is our agenda. This is our order. This is what we're planning. This is where we're going. Okay, Jesus, come on. Did you see the crowd? Jesus going to Jairus' house. Come on, crowd, let's lead Jesus to Jairus' house. And along the way, there was a woman who has been suffering for 12 years. She was broken and, and lost everything, and nothing could help her. And she was there amongst that crowd. And she couldn't get close enough to Jesus to have a conversation because the crowd was on the move. She couldn't get close enough to Jesus to stop and talk with him. She, she maybe couldn't hear her voice over the crowd of the noise. She just said, if I could just get a touch of the hem of his garment, I know I've gotten close enough. And she does. And the crowd is clueless. And Jesus said, somebody just touched me. And the disciples are like, oh, Jesus, you're in a crowd. There's all kinds of people around you. No, Jesus is pointing out, you all missed it. Something just happened. And somebody's life has changed forever. See, sometimes Jesus stops and says, I know we're, we're planning on going there, and we'll get there. But we have to stop right now. There's a woman here who needs me. So sometimes in the crowd, we're unaware of what's happening or the, in the kingdom that we're living in. I love this morning before service. We had a connecting time this morning. Thank you, Rich, for leading that. And, and I just love that. Hey, does everybody know this person's name? He, he gave a little quiz this morning. Uh, uh, he picked some people everybody knew. But I, I'm sure there are some names that are gathered here today that not everybody knows. There are some people watching online that not everybody knows your name. And it's good for us to connect. And it's good for us to be aware. When we walk in, we tune in. I walk in here on a Sunday morning before you guys get here you usually, and I'm, I often think to myself, God, what are you going to do today? In one of those classrooms, or in here, in the lobby, in the parking lot, where I'm least expecting it, what are you going to do this morning? Because I know you have a plan. See, there's a crowd 
There are people who are gathering in the name of Jesus. And there are all kinds of people. And that's okay. You know what? That's good. We want Jesus. And we want our lives to attract skeptics, confused, curious, all kinds of people seeking answers. Right? May we never forget the diversity of the gathering. May we never forget that the gathering is not about us, it's about Jesus. May we never, or may we always remember that there are hurting people in the crowd. May we always be okay that there will be skeptics, there will be confused, even excited people. But may people always find their way to the gathering to find Jesus. Jesus told a parable about a sower and seeds, and feeds, seeds fell on different soils, and some grew and some didn't. Some flourished and some only lasted a little while. But the point is, is the sower planted seeds on all kinds of soils. All right? Our goal is we would love for everybody to be good soil. But the sower will seed on any soil that is willing to accept it. Our gatherings, what we call Sunday morning worship services, are for everyone. They will have all kinds of people attending. People will be at different places in their journey with Jesus. Some may grow, some might not. But we strive to create a place where people can come to gather in the name of Jesus. Not a place for some people to gather. You know, there are some churches who create Sunday gatherings just for believers. And if you're a curious person coming in, you don't really feel welcome. You know, the music, the message, the environment, it's only for the religious people. There are some churches who, who create Sunday gatherings for only outsiders. They call them seeker-sensitive. Have you heard that? Seeker-sensitive churches. It's only for the curious and the unsaved. And they're all that matters in the decision-making of what the Sunday morning service will look like. They plan the music, the message, the environment just for them. There are some churches that decide that they're going to create Sunday gatherings only for a certain age group. They plan their music, the message, the environment for an older group or younger group, or you guys get it, right? We're only going to do hymns or piano uh, and fire and brimstone preaching, or we're only going to do contemporary music, lights and fog and a band and a youthful message. You guys get the point, right? They say, okay, we're just picking a segment and that's who we are, but we... We have to recognize right here, right now, God has not just given us young people or old people. God has not just given us traditional or contemporary people. Our crowd is diverse. And every single one of you matters to Jesus. And we want all kinds of people to gather. We want the curious to come and have questions answered. We want the excited to be able to come and celebrate. We want the skeptics to come and experience something for real in their lives. We want the confused to find truth. Now, I know church leaders are sometimes pulled by a segment of the gathering in one direction. Sometimes a few people get together and say, hey, are you a confused and unsure, a skeptic, or excited? right? You don't have to ask if they're the excited ones. You know who they are, right? And then you find like-minded people, you know? And so all of a sudden, the excited people sit together, and the real religious sit together, and the confused people are all sitting, you know, like, I'm just, I need a view where I can sit and look around, right? I, and they find each other, and then they go to the pastor. Pastor, I, I, you should gear it more towards us. Or church leaders, hey, you should make it more about us, And I get it. I understand it. Because you want that experience with Jesus. But leaders within a church need to recognize that the gathering that is here is for everyone. And anyone should be able to come to Jesus. And so what we do is try not to get in the way. (laughs) And we try to step back at times and just say, Jesus... Change it, do it. You know, some weeks 
you'll come in here and you'll be like, oh, look at, they're singing grace, grace, I love that old song, you know, hey, I love, great is thy faithfulness. And then some other people will be like, ah, it's okay. And next week, I don't even know what's next week, but you guys get the point, next week they'll sing a couple other songs and it's like, ah, and you'll be like, whoa. Remember, it's not always centered around us. But as the gathering gathers, there will always be something for everyone. Because, because Jesus is here. And sometimes you let those excited people be excited. And sometimes you let those confused people ask questions. You'd be like, oh, okay, here we go again. But guess what? Jesus is there. And we're all going to be fed. And we're all going to grow. I understand. But also understand, out of this gathering is where many people start their journey. Jesus called fishermen when preaching to the crowd. Zacchaeus was uh, called out of the crowd. And Jesus went to his home that day. And he was never the same. Jesus called Matthew as a crowd was passing by his tax booth. It was during the gatherings that the disciples learned how to minister. It was during the gatherings that Jesus performed most of his miracles. You know, we're going to have times when we say, oh, but pastor, there needs to be time when we can really be more intimate and more, yeah. And we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks. See, there's a journey that we're all on. And every part of this, every stage of this journey is important. And to be honest, every one of them is necessary. See, after we talk about gathering, we talk about growing. See, we cannot accomplish everything in the gathering. We can't accomplish everything in this hour. This is a place when we all come together to seek Jesus. May Jesus be the center. May we recognize the need for everyone to be ministered to. May we be patient as Jesus ministers to others. May we learn from others how to respond and what Jesus can do. Sometimes we might celebrate and other times we might stop and pray for healing. And other times we might address the confused or reiterate something that some still don't understand. While other times we may learn something we've never heard before. Guess what? This is all part of being in a gathering. It's the first stage in the vision of the church. And there's more to come as we talk about the next few weeks. But in Hebrews 10, we're going to end with this, 24, 25. It says, let us consider how we may spur on one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We don't give up meeting. We don't give up gathering. But we, we recognize the need for gathering. And, 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 and some say, we don't need to gather. We don't need that. No, we need this. There are times when we... We'll, we'll learn that this is so valuable to our walk. May we acknowledge our need to gather. May we acknowledge the purpose of gathering as only the first stage of the vision. And we need to grow in other ways beyond this. But may we ask God to open our eyes, see those around us, restore his grace upon us to see what he is doing and how he's doing it amongst the gathering of people. Amen. Let's pray right now. Lord God, we just praise you this morning for your grace, your wonderful grace, that even though we have all fallen short, that you have a plan to bring us all into you, into relationship with you, into your love. Lord, I know that sometimes we, we don't get it. Sometimes we're confused. Sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we're oblivious and don't understand what's happening. But I'm asking you, Lord, that you would help us to understand. Help us to be aware. When we gather together in the gathering, help us to know that you have a plan that is beyond us, that is greater than us. 
a plan, Lord, that is to reach every individual. Lord, help us to not see ourselves as, a, as one group, but see ourselves as a gathering of individuals, all with specific needs, all with a past, all with a, a, a journey that has brought us together. Lord, help us to be open to how you want to move every time we gather, whose life you, you want to change. Lord, but my prayer is that everyone would find you. Everyone would see you as the center. Everyone, everyone would be touched by you and changed in your timing, in your way. Lord, speak and move in us. Help us to know you better. I'm going to ask everybody to keep your heads bowed just for a moment here this morning and just be still before Jesus. He's here. Lord, is there anybody that's in the crowd that just hasn't understood it before but just knows that they need you? That you just want to deliver today, you want to save today. If Jesus is speaking to you today and you just want to accept him into your life and you want to make this as a starting point of your journey with him, a return back to him. I'm just going to ask you to lift up your hand that I could pray with you and remember you in my prayers throughout the week. I thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Lord, you see those hands that were raised and you know that, that today the gathering is here, but you're here and that's why we're here. Lord, this would be totally meaningless if you weren't here. And Lord, I thank you today that this is meaning something to some people here. And I thank you for those hands that were lifted that said, yes, I need to commit my life to you or I need to recommit it to you. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would just be faithful to that hand that was raised, those hands that were raised, that, that you would forgive any sins that were committed, that you would heal their hearts from their past, deliver them, Lord, and be Lord of their life. And may they remember this day of June 26, 2022, as a, as a new start to their life in this journey. Forgive them completely, wash away their sins, and and we thank you. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people say, amen. I'm going to ask for a moment that all of you would be a part of the excited group of the crowd today. And let's just praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. It says that angels rejoice.